It is my pleasure now to ask to the front here, Dr. Michael Mulvaney, with his presentation titled, How Engaged Citizen Scientists Transformed Nature Conservation in the ACT. Thank you, Michelle. Um, citizens changing, transforming even, uh, the way a state territory does uh, conservation, that, that's a big claim. And for those of you who've noticed I'm from Canberra and by word association has linked me to that word bulldust, um, I hope by the end of the talk that you'll actually see that the claim has merit. Um, the other things I, I hope from the talk is that uh, you will um, have an example where citizen science can affect actions of government immediately. Within five seconds of someone doing something, there can be a reaction. So that's a good example. And the last thing, the platform that has allowed this transformation in how we do conservation in ACT, if you think it's a good fit for your community, you're welcome to have it. So they're what I'm headed for. Oops. So this uh, transformation came about from a cloud software uh, platform called Nature Mapper, which was developed as a hobby, uh, virtually at no cost, by a computer whiz called Aaron Clausen. Um, and it's just developed, getting better and better over time. It's been going for three years. It actually operates across the ACT and all of the surrounding shires in New South Wales within Canberra Nature Map. And Libby does my job, or volunteers, like I do, uh, in terms of uh, Atlas of Life and Coastal Wilderness, which runs off the same platform. So how does it work? It's pretty similar to a lot of other things you've been hearing about today. Your basic, a nature lover takes a photo on either their smartphone or GPS-enabled camera. Um, they load that into the system. They log in as, as a user. So their name, the date of the photograph, where it was located is stripped out of the preferences and you get a location of where it is. Um, and we also ask them to pull down a list and give a measure of abundance. So it's a pretty standard way of getting a location and abundance for a particular species. Where it gets a little bit different but still shares a lot with some of the things is um, that person who puts the siding, if they think they know what it is, they can go from a drop-down memory and uh, menu and suggest it or they can just say I don't know. Most people at least can get to an order and say yeah it's a plant or it's a, an insect. Um, depending on what they do, an email then is sent to one of 70 volunteer moderators who basically look at that image and will ID it for the people. And they range from our fungi is done by a guy called Heino Leap who's you know, one of, I think there's only four um, guys nationally who, know, who, who can do that work. Um, our birds are done by a 16-year-old kid um, and, and we're in between. With the moderators, we have apprentice moderators. So we've got a guy who's learning how to do the dragonflies. He does the easy dragonflies and um, eventually he'll become the expert taking the load off our current guy who's doing most of the dragonflies and that's across all the orders. There's an email discussion. Anybody can join that discussion. Anybody can say what they think that uh, species is and basically that's what a, uh, a record looks like. So there's a map. You can load up to five photos. It tells you what was being recorded nearby and it has all the comments and the history of confirmation and identification behind it. Within it, there's a whole lot of systems which make people so that you can basically uh, load up your records. You can... Uh, view your records, you can analyse um, and you can just organise them in any way you like. So you can get all species just for your property, for the particular reserve that you're a friend in. You can then get a field guide for those species within there. It's a photographic one. Or if you're a pretty strange person and you've got a real interest in bristle flies, for example, you can just see all the bristle flies within our, within our region. Um, I'm not telling you this heaps of other things to do with it, but the point is that people like using it and they find it very easy and it's giving them what they want. They can organise their own data. So it's been going, well it's been 
It started off as just Aaron was supposed to be giving me rare plant records and he put it on the internet and people eavesdropped into our discussion and it's just exploded. Um, but over that three years, um, we've had 60,000 um, uh, photos or, or individual wildlife images added. Um, and that's from a base in the ACT. We had a wildlife atlas which had 20,000 species in it. So it's uh, increased a lot of information. But actually, where there's been the biggest gain is that our um, community groups have really enjoyed it because the way Aaron has constructed it, the control of who runs the site is run by the people in charge of that particular order or group or even we get down to we've got people in charge of bristle flies. Um, so they've made available uh, for the first time their database. So the, the Canberra pathologist group, the herpetologist group, um, they've all started putting their records in where they didn't trust uh, government previously but because they're in charge of what goes in they set the settings about who can see what, um, they've added it in. So Within three years I've gone from having a database of 20,000 species to a database that's now got 1,153,000 species as of a week ago. It's probably got another couple of thousand since then. Now the biggest indication of what that has meant on the ground, um, if you look at rare plant records, in the uh, three years since it's been operating, we've had as many rare plant records in our system as what we'd collected over the previous 110 years. And that includes all the herbarium records and, and everything. What that has meant is our scientific committee has looked at our rare plant list, which did consist of 317 plants. They've been able to take 54 plants off, like the yam daisy and the silky Swanson's pea, which means we can direct our conservation effort into those plants that really need it. The Canberra spider orchid up the top there, endemic to Canberra, Five years ago we spent $15,000 paying a orchid expert to survey for this orchid and hopefully come up with new species. He did increase the uh, size of one known uh, population uh, but didn't find any new locations. Without even asking for it, citizen science have found four new populations of this, uh, is four? Yes, four, um, of this orchid. And doubled the pop our known population from 400 to 800 species. One of those new locations, it was an offset, so some people don't like it, but basically it's resulted in a, a, the creation of a new reserve. Um, this is all within a few years. Canberra spider orchid isn't on its own. We've got 42 listed threatened species in the ACT. In that time that it's been operating, and we started with, well, we started with rare plants and then st people started putting normal plants on and I said no, 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 I don't want those and they just ignored me and then they shoved weeds on and <laughs> then they started putting animals on no matter what I said they just kept putting it on. <laughs> so some of these things have only been on, the, uh, only been active for, for six months but in that time um, for roughly 30% of our threatened species we have more than doubled either the known locations of them or the numbers of uh, the, the, their total population. Um, so, and that includes all those species. It includes this uh, Alpine red spot dragonfly, which we thought was extinct. Uh, someone just happened to photograph it by the road. The, um, I should say, um, in terms of what that means, is those new locations, we're getting evidence about abundance. I saw a poster which had uh, 1,000 sightings of uh, Rosenberg's monitor. Well, we're only up to about 75, but that was from less than 20. But that has led to us realising it's actually more abundant in the ACT than we thought. And there's now a research program which is putting cameras out to actually find out where are, where, where are our hotspots and we're um, recording termite mounts. Um, yes, similarly, it's built into the re recovery actions where we're we're reviewing our woodland action plan at the moment, so quite a few of these species are woodland species. People are really good at finding things, they walk around the area and they're really good at finding things that are sort of new, they don't quite know what they are, I haven't seen that before, so that's why we get a lot of rare things, but we also get a lot of weeds. Um, and that's been really fantastic. I've got, I'm saying on many tens of occasions, actually, because I was giving the talk, I thought I'd better check it out. 
and it's over on over 200 occasions we've had a record that's come in by a photo of a plant that hasn't either been in the ACT before or it's the first record within a particular reserve. And those records are normally of one, two, three, you know, up to ten plants. So I can send a team out and say, look, we've got this marsh marigold. Um, it's a real potential to become really widespread all over our grassland reserve. Let's just control that can patch now and, and, it's, and it's done. And that's happened on more than 200 occasions, which is more than once a week. It's happening so often that we're actually setting up a early intervention team to control these, which will be a, a park care, care team. When a particular species comes in, they'll get an email and they'll work it out through that discussion about how to control that species. Once you've got people pointing cameras at wildlife, you can actually direct them to do things. So we were being accused of uh, destroying the orchid uh, diversity on Black Mountain Sandstone. And to tell you the truth, we couldn't say whether they were right in their accusations or wrong. So we said, well, let's work together and find it out. So we stratified that area by fire history. The darker, the more green it is, the less burning it's had. The, the orange is, is pretty intense. So we stratified those areas with 120 plots. We put a, a star picket, asked people to adopt a star picket and to go and photograph every orchid within 50 metres of that plot. It didn't matter if we got lilies or you know, things that were nowhere near orchids because we had our orchid volunteer moderators confirming those species. Uh, we got something like 36 different orchid species and about 10,000 different uh, records which were analysed and it found out, no, we weren't actually reducing diversity, um, but it gave us complications in that we've got rare orchids that some that need a lot of fire and some that need no fire. So we're now managing in accordance to that. The other thing um, it's done is it's opened our eyes. Previously, like a lot of state conservation agencies, we would have said, if we were looking after our vegetation, we're going to be looking after the little things. Um, Whereas now the top three are, are three butterflies, which are the, either these are the first records in 20 years of uh, them in the ACT. It's a yellow jewel, a sticky hair streak, and a banks is brown. Um, they all have complex relationships with vegetation, and fire can destroy them. So basically, with the silky hair streak, we actually had a burn plan the week. Uh, uh, after this record came in, the record came in and that, that control burn was, was called off um, and changed so that we were keeping that habitat. In the education that we're putting out, we're including things we never used to talk about. I'm happy to say, because I'm following you guys, that, included, that includes fungi, um, but, you know, invertebrates. So it's really changed the scope of our conversation. Now, ACT is really not state, we're more like a local government area, and my job is like the equivalent of an environment officer. I provide all the wildlife advice into the planning and development decisions. So I can say I actually use this citizen science data every day, and it's affecting decisions daily, and um, about 50% of the advice that I'm providing has come from citizen science. So, that, and that's from a very short history, but also consultants, schools, everybody can um, tap into this information. So um, the Commonwealth, who doesn't need our approval, they can just do whatever they like. They wanted to pump water from Lake Burley Griffin and water the beautiful lawns of uh, Parliament House. They were going to put a, the pipeline straight through uh, that area up through there next to the new Chinese embassy, but our citizens had put these locations of this endangered daisy button rinkawort. So, even before they did any plans, they ruled it out. So early in the process, someone's used that information. Just want to show that it's not only governments that are using it. So this is a landowner in New South Wales. OEH hasn't provided any funding, but uh, we cover probably 20% of our records come from New South Wales. So this is a, an owner. She got sort of a bit wild about wanting to know what the wildlife was on not only her property, but her brother's own the adjoining one. So she's taken a whole lot of snaps. She's put them up and um, our various experts have identified what the bat is that's on her property, what the um, sawfly larvae is, uh, what the wasp is. 
Um, the pretty blue flower there is a plant called Tweedia, which is actually a weed from South America. So that, that's come in. I, I've said to, I've sent an email to Carol, I said, Carolyn, that uh, weed, it's, it's a real problem for us on Red Hill. If you've only got a few, you might want to take it out. She said, I've only got the one plant, I'll go and dig it out. Mike, who's a land carer from another area, he was listening into our conversation and he said, oh, hold on, it's got these roots that are really hard to get out, so make sure you get it out. So Carolyn sends, posts a picture back saying, yeah, I've, I've pulled it out and, and there it is, and it's got rid of that weed on her property. One of the other photos, if you're observing, you might have observed this uh, Parunga grasshopper, only known now from 30 locations in the world, of which Carolyn's property is one. Um, so I can give her that feedback. She gets excited and she's made uh, her and her brother's land a, a conservation area and she can use that to produce her own field guides. So um, if this, one of you, you, Aaron's just done it out of the goodness of his heart um, and it's a fantastic system. Um, but if anybody um, thinks it might be a fit with your community, please come and get a, a sheet to tell you how you you can grab the platform. Thank you.